evening and welcome to our talk on the Vietnam War and the transformation of America. This is the second talk in our Destinations and Discovery series sponsored by Cavalier Travels and UVA's Office of Engagement. My name is Mary Lynn Musser and I am the Assistant Director of Cavalier Travels, UVA's Alumni and Parent Travel Program. I am pleased to be with you on what happens to be our university's Founders Day, the day we celebrate Thomas Jefferson's birthday, April 13th, 1743. Before we get started, I'd like to highlight several webinar logistics. We are recording today's program and we'll share a link to the recording in a follow-up email in case you would like to revisit today's conversation. We will also post a link on the Cavalier Travels webpage. At any time during the webinar, you may use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit questions to our speaker. We will get to as many as possible with the time we have. If you pre-submitted a question when you registered, we have it on our list of questions, so you do not need to submit it again today. And now, I am pleased to introduce this evening's speaker, William Hitchcock. Will is the James Madison Professor of History at the University of Virginia. His work and teaching focus on the global history of the 20th century, in particular, the era of the two world wars and the Cold War. He received a BA from Kenyon College and a PhD from Yale University. Before joining the faculty here at UVA, he taught at Yale University, Wellesley College, and Temple University. He has published several books and has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, a winner of the George Lewis Beer Prize, and a Financial Times bestseller in the UK. Will is with us today to discuss the war in Vietnam. Welcome, Will. I will now turn it over to you and join you later in the program with questions from our audience. Thank you, Mary Lynn, and uh, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, of course, it's only virtual, and I just wanna throw out an invitation right at the, uh, the get-go. If you find yourselves on grounds uh, in Charlottesville in the area, come on over to um, the history department, say hello. You can always find interesting people there, and you can always come in and sit on sit in on a class. I teach history of the Cold War, uh, the Second World War, war and society, various other topics, and it would be lovely to have you come and see us in person anytime. Well, today I really stuck my foot in it. I'm trying to talk about the transformation of America during the Vietnam War in only about 30 minutes. So let's not uh, beat around the bush and let's just uh, dive in. This is a big topic. Um, it's the subject of an enormous scholarly literature. So many people have written about the Vietnam War, both the war itself in Vietnam, but also its domestic ramifications. We have an awful lot uh, of things we could talk about, but we only have a limited time. So I'm just going to kind of touch a few key uh, things that I think will both seem familiar, but also I hope will illuminate some of the crucial items, um, crucial sort of ways of thinking about the, the war. Uh, I'm going to share a screen just because that keeps me uh, going and keeps me organized, and it'll allow you to see a few of things that I'm uh, that I'm talking about as we go. So I'm going to talk about five things, and I'll hit each of these for just a few minutes. We can always come back to them in the Q&A. How did the Vietnam War change America back home, and really American ideas about itself? I'll just touch on these items, and then we'll move on. Uh, to your questions. The Vietnam War ruptured the Cold War consensus. I'll explain what that means in a moment, but it had a big impact on the way Americans thought about the Cold War itself. Second, it spurred a new youth culture of dissent and protest, and that's probably the thing that we're all most familiar about, with when we talk about the Vietnam War. Uh, and so this is a really big topic that probably comes to mind immediately when you think about the Vietnam War on the home front. It changed the course of the civil rights movement quite significantly. And I think that's something we, we should, whoops, uh, we need to take into account as well. Uh, the civil rights movement, as I'll talk about, had made a lot of progress in the decade before the Vietnam War, and uh, that was going to be changed afterwards. The Vietnam War tarnished America's standing in the world quite considerably, but it also compelled a period of reflection and, and 
for a brief time anyway, a period of, of humility. And I wanna talk about that and what happened to that as well. Before we get into the, um, the, the, the details of those five points, could I just begin with what I think we may all agree is really one of the most important points that we, sh we should all recognize is that war leads to the deaths of lots and lots of people, particularly young men in uniform, but also many, many, many civilians in this case. Over 58,000 Americans were killed in the war. Um, that's a very high number, and we, uh, we memorialize them and we honor them whenever we talk about the Vietnam War, but also when we go to so many of the Vietnam uh, memorials that are now scattered around the country. Over 150,000 Americans were wounded in, in combat, and maybe a number you're not as familiar with, almost two and a half to almost three million Americans served in uniform. Uh, in South Vietnam at some point. So that's, as you can see, an enormous number of people who were touched by the war. Not just the men who were killed, the men and women who were killed and their families, but also the, the many, many millions who served there. But let's also remember that as many as 2 million Vietnamese were killed in this conflict, which after all, for them, lasted for 30 years. So the Vietnam War is absolutely epic in scale and in suffering. And I think that's something we must never forget as we get into the nitty gritty and, and debate different interpretations. We must remember this was a terrible event for so many, um, so many people. Now I mentioned at the beginning, the, the Vietnam War ruptured the Cold War consensus. I think that's a very important way in which the war impacted Americans. What do I mean by that? Well, at the beginning, in the first 20 to 25 years of the Cold War, American elites, po politicians, our political leaders, presidents, people in the media, people in the universities, college professors, we all basically held to a similar idea that the Cold War was a just struggle against a very devious enemy, the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union's allies, that communism was a terrible threat to the American way of life. This was a basic view widely held by um, figures in public life in America. And it, it was almost unquestioned. There were different attitudes about how to, how to then wage the Cold War, but that idea that the Cold War was a just cause, a noble cause, was widespread. Not only that, the lessons of the Second World War were that when you met an evil, expansive, tyrannical ideology, you should fight it rather than appease it, right? That was the lesson of World War II, appeasement is bad, confrontation is the only way to stop evil. Well, many Americans accepted that argument and they applied it to the Soviet Union and to communism. So stop the Soviets and their allies wherever they are. That was, you know, really a central thesis of the, uh, of the first half of the Cold War. In this sense, the Soviets rapidly sort of became in American minds almost as bad as Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan, expansive and aggressive and dangerous to the American way of life. A good example of how this was articulated at the time is Lyndon Johnson, who gave a famous speech in 1965, just as he was escalating the number of American troops in Vietnam. And he asked a rhetorical question in this speech, and I wish I could play it because his accent is so wonderful. But he says, why must this nation hazard its ease, which is a very interesting phrase, hazard its ease and its interest and its power for the sake of this people so far away? Why, why are we doing this? And he was speaking to the American public. And his answer was, we fight because we must fight if we are to live in a world where every country can shape its own destiny, a world where our freedom will be secure. So why are we fighting? To make our freedom secure. Why is this our concern? Why are we in South Vietnam? Johnson answered his own rhetorical question with these words. We are there because we have a promise to keep. Wow, very powerful. When the president tells you, you've made a promise, You've made a promise, not just to the people of South Vietnam, but to all free peoples everywhere that you've got their back. And if you don't, you, not only are those people going to be destroyed and steamrolled by communism, uh, 
But you at home might not enjoy your peace and your democracy anymore either. And the reason that was such a powerful argument in 1965 is because it was the same argument Americans made in 1941 and 42, right up until 1945 in World War II. So the connection between Vietnam and World War II is very powerful. The generation that started the American Americans down the path to, uh, to, to war in Vietnam were young young men in World War II, and many of them served in World War II. So remember the connections. That was the world they knew. So it was a powerful argument in Ameri to, for Americans to hear. Well, 10 years of fighting started to undermine all of this. 10 years of the Vietnam War, 65 to 75, you know, made people rethink these ideas. Who was America fighting for? South Vietnam? Was South Vietnam such a good, a good cause to defend? South Vietnam was a military dictatorship. Where was the freedom that Americans were supposed to be defending in South Vietnam? It was a, it was a, it was a corrupt, uh, oppressive uh, dictatorship governed by the military. And before that, it had been governed by No Dinh Diem, who was, a, who was a, a, an extraordinarily um, a vicious authoritarian leader. So, you know, there was some gaps here between what we were doing and what we were talking about. So that gap started to really erode the Cold War consensus. Johnson made it sound like we have a promise to keep to our allies. So that means credibility. Our credibility is on the line. If we don't fight in Vietnam, our allies won't trust us anymore. But even our allies didn't want the Vietnam War to go on. So why was there credibility at stake? To whom were we trying to demonstrate our credibility? Even our best friends. We're saying this war is terrible for you guys. Don't do it. And the war in Vietnam wasn't helping America to win the Cold War. It was making America look weak because we couldn't win the war. We could not achieve our objectives in Vietnam. We looked weak. And domestically, um, a great deal of upheaval at home made us look weak as well. So the logic that Johnson spoke of at the beginning started to fall apart. And it really was never quite put back together. So in one major way, then, the Vietnam War eroded the Cold War consensus, and it sh started to shatter the arguments about credibility that had been so powerful before that time. Okay, a second topic I wanted to touch on is the one, of course, you're probably most familiar with, which is, you know, what the, what the, the, the Vietnam War did at, uh, on the home front, especially to young people. Now, you know, youth culture was already changing in America at this time, and there was already a great deal of uh, questioning of the hierarchies of family and university life and, and corporate life in America. A younger generation born after World War II were starting to ask tough questions, but the Vietnam War totally accelerated this process of, of a whole new generation asking hard questions about their parents and about the world their parents had built. And they wanted more of everything, more freedom, more sexual freedom, more artistic freedom. They wanted co-education for women. They questioned capitalism. They wanted birth control. I mean, this was a generation that was asking their parents to get out of the way so they could lead their lives the way that they wanted to. And there was a great deal of, of tendency to romanticize anti-colonial revolutionaries. I have I put up Che Guevara's uh, famous picture here because he was a figure of uh, of adoration amongst this generation. Nobody really knew what Che was all about. In fact, he, but he, he was so handsome and he looked great in a beret and he became a figure of revolutionary fervor and admiration. So once the war started, it was the perfect piece of evidence to say that this generation has ruined the world. And you, this quote captures that anger so wonderfully. The leader of the Students for Democratic Society wrote, the Vietnam War has provided the razor, the terrifying, sharp, cutting edge that has finally severed the last vestiges of illusion that morality and democracy are the guiding principles of American foreign policy. Wow. The Vietnam War has ripped down the curtain, and there's no more talking about the Cold War consensus anymore, at least in the eyes of these students. So you probably remember, just some of you on this call remember what that was like at the time. You know, and scenes like this um, were all too all too common. Of course, this is Kent State in Ohio in 1970. Um, it was the students at Kent State, like many other college campuses around the country, were protesting the expansion of the war into Cambodia. And um, as you all know all too well, the National Guard troops that were called out to meet the college students on their own campus 
who were protesting using their free speech rights, uh, they were shot at by this contingent of um, National Guardsmen and four of them were killed. This then triggered huge numbers of protests all around the country at college campuses, including, of course, uh, the University of Virginia. And I'm sure that it's, this may, um, for some of you may, may bring back memories, for some of you maybe you didn't know, but the University of Virginia also was the site of a very substantial anti-war protest. It, it had begun to protest the, the expansion of the war in Cambodia, but it was intensified by the, deaths, the shooting deaths in, in Kent State. And it was a, a remarkable moment in the university's history. Um, it, this, this was a major protest that lasted over a week. It was an attempt by the students to essentially shut the university down as a form of protest. They uh, occupied the ROTC building, Maury Hall. Um, it, it was a major you know, a confrontation of the kind that was happening all around the country. What I find interesting as someone who did not go to the University of Virginia as a student, but who came here only 12 years ago, is that I think of the University of Virginia as a largely conservative, and I don't mean politically, I mean socially, place. And I imagine it was fairly straight in the 1970s, in the early 70s, but this place just exploded with anger in, at this event, in, in May of 1970. So much so that the, um, the, the police were, uh, you know, as, as some of you will know, police started uh, knocking heads and arresting students famously, infamously, some of the students were arrested and thrown into a Mayflower moving van and carried down to the police headquarters and booked. It was an embarrassment for the university. They'd lost control of the situation. Uh, the president of the university, um, and Mr. Shannon, uh, addressed the students and tried to, tried to reason with them, said he too was anti-war. He too believed in their right to protest, but he didn't want to shut down the university. Things would carry on. And that helped, that helped to pour oil on troubled waters. But I just want to remind you, like, this moment in University of Virginia, the University of Virginia's history was a radical moment, a radical moment. And it, it, you, you, you may not remember just how, um, how, how far-reaching student demands were, not just at this university, but all across the country, the UVA student committee that called for the strike and that wanted to shut down the university listed nine demands that they wanted. Some of them included no police on the University of Virginia grounds at all, no ROTC at the University of Virginia, no defense research undertaken at the university, a demand that 20 percent uh, that that um, the incoming student body always be 20 percent African-American and that money be spent on recruitment for African-American students, the admission of women, which was only gonna happen in September of 1970, by the way, the right of employees to collectively bargain. So that's the students talking about their social demands. I just wanna say, universities get a lot of guff these days for being left-wing. And I can assure you that that list of demands is far more radical than things that you will hear at the University of Virginia today. So you who were there in 1970, you guys were the real radicals. All right. Anyhow, this particular uh, episode wound down, but it became um, it became a, a real point of, uh, of anguish for the university, a, a memory that some cherish and some still to this day feel was a, brought, brought a kind of tarnished UVA's reputation. Okay, I'm moving along briskly because I, I want to make sure that you know, we have plenty of time for Q&A. But my third touch point that I wanted to mention um, that I think is really important is because we must always wrap together threads that sometimes get told separately. The history of civil rights sometimes is told over there and the history of, of the Vietnam War or American foreign relations is sometimes told over, over here, but actually they're very closely intertwined and this is a good example. So the reason that the Vietnam War actually harmed, or at least changed, altered the trajectory of the civil rights movement can be, uh, can be best described this way. In the decade before the Vietnam War began, the decade before the war began, enormous number of advances were made in the civil rights, um, in the civil rights, by the civil rights movement, starting at least with the 1954 Brown versus Board decision, which had been in the works for a long time, which um, ordered the desegregation of public schools. 
1957 Little Rock incident in which President Eisenhower sent in the National Guard uh, to accompany the Little Rock Nine, nine black students who wanted to go to high school in, in their high school in Little Rock. Uh, a national, um, a moment of national reckoning that Eisenhower said, we're going to use federal force if we have to, to, um, to apply the law. Uh, the beginnings of the sit-ins in 1960 across the country, um, demanding, you know, shedding a light on the segregation in lunch counters and uh, other public spaces. Uh, the I Have a Dream speech, the Million Man March, you know, the uh, in, in Washington, D.C., um, and then, of course, most importantly, the dramatic changes that John F. Kennedy just started to put in motion before his death, and then Lyndon Johnson, um, who in 1964 and 1965 signed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Ten years of enormous progress. Well, the Vietnam War upended this. Why? In part, it was because Martin Luther King Jr. had a difficult choice to make, one that he could only make. In, in one direction, and that was that he spoke out against the war. Now, to speak out against the war for King was hard. Why? Because Lyndon Johnson was president. This was Lyndon Johnson's war. For King to criticize the war was for King to criticize Lyndon Johnson. And Johnson felt personally attacked because, after all, look what he had done. Look all, at all the things he had done, at great political sacrifice and risk, and now how is he repaid? Uh, Black leaders were criticizing the war. So it, it, it broke apart the fragile coalition that had pushed through so many changes in American society in that short period of time. And the speech that Martin Luther King gave was called A Time to Break Silence. I want to urge you, please, after we finish here, go, go Google it and just read it. You can actually listen to it. You can hear the audio online. It is absolutely overwhelming in its power. What made it so powerful? Because King called out American hypocrisy. That's why. And it was painful for him to do it, but he felt that he had to do it. He said, this war in Vietnam is taking the black young men who'd been crippled by our society, crippled by the poverty and lack of opportunity, crippled by our society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. In a nutshell, in a nutshell, that was the argument against the war. And King made it as only he could do, as only he could find the words. You should probably um, you know, be reminded, if you, if you probably knew this, you may not, have, may not have had it at the, the tip of your tongue, but Martin Luther King got huge amounts of criticism for this speech, not just from the president of the Democratic Party, but from the New York Times. Mainstream American media and, and political elites criticized King for being anti-war. That's how hard it was to break the Cold War consensus. So it's, it's a, um, a remarkable moment. And of course, it started to break apart the Democratic Party itself. And the most vivid evidence, of course, for this was the infamous uh, Democratic National uh, uh, Convention in Chicago in August of 1968, which was um, an absolute scandal uh, in which Anti-war protesters in the streets were met with force, billy clubs, arrests, beatings, uh, all on live television broadcast around the country and indeed around the world. And it showed that America had been broken. America had been broken by the Vietnam War. Now, Richard Nixon, who had run for president in 1960 and been defeated, uh, took advantage of this and said, no, America is not broken. Um, America is still loyal and honest and has integrity, and we believe in, in patriotism, and we believe in the Cold War, and uh, that's what I want to run on, and a law and order platform and all the rest of it. And Nixon uh, won uh, in 1968 as a result of democratic disarray, whereas poor Hubert Humphrey, who was running on the democratic ticket, had to, had to bear the burden of Lyndon Johnson's war. And he had to be pro-war, even though he said he was pro-negotiation. He could never get out from under the weight of the war. Nixon, too, was actually very hawkish on the war, of course, but he claimed that he had a special plan that would help end the war. If only he were elected, then he would put his special plan into operation. Well, we won't go down that rabbit hole, but Nixon wasn't really telling the truth, believe it or not. 
And in any case, it led to the crushing and defeat of the Democrats in power. And in many ways, the rupture of, of the Democratic Party uh, would have to put itself, uh, it's put itself back together again um, after this, the Vietnam War was over. I'm just gonna move on to my last two points here. Um, and these are difficult ones to, uh, to, to talk about, but especially this one, but I think we have to acknowledge that the Vietnam War tarnished America's standing in the world. Now this may seem obvious, but what exactly was it about the war that tarnished America's standing? I wanna remind you that in 1965, at the beginning of the war, um, and I say this as someone who spent a lot of time in Europe and I studied France and I wrote a book, a number of books about Europe and France that uh, Americans were widely admired around the world in, uh, in the 1960s. And indeed, the, the presidency of John F. Kennedy was, was, a, was a, almost a global event. He was so popular and Americans were so popular. Um, and they were, Americans were still thought to be that nation that, uh, that, that helped to liberate Europe and Asia from a tyranny, from Nazi tyranny, from Japanese militarism and imperialism. Uh, America was still at that time a country that did things the right way. Its democracy was a beacon for, for, for billions of people around the world. Vietnam put a lot of stress on that, um, on that image of the United States. Of course, it wasn't just My Lai, which I'll talk about in a sec, but it was the methods which the Vietnam War um, brought forth, the carpet bombing of targets, not just in South Vietnam, but eventually in North Vietnam, and indeed eventually in, in Cambodia. Uh, the huge amount of aerial bombardment that did indiscriminate damage to civilians as well as to military targets. Uh, the use of chemical defoliants, Agent Orange and other herbicides that were designed to you know, kill off all the greenery so that the Americans could then see where the Viet Cong were hiding was, a, you know, of course, triggered a terrible environmental catastrophe. We didn't even know how bad it was, but nonetheless, spraying um, defoliants on, on, uh, on a on a nation uh, in order to be able, better to be able to kill their people is uh, not something that was gonna go over very well. The My Lai massacre is just kind of encapsulates only in one, you know, one example uh, of this. Um, it, it, the event was an absolute horror of unspeakable proportions. And if you, um, if you wanna follow up on it, please do. There's a great deal of uh, vivid documentation about what happened there in which uh, US uh, army soldiers wiped out a village killed and brutally, mis brutally mistreated and then killed many, many people in this town, this little village, uh, wiped it off the face of the earth, basically. Um, by chance, very much by chance, uh, the event was made public only through the sleuthing of um, Seymour Hirsch, the um, investigative reporter who had discovered that there had been a photographer present who had taken pictures. And eventually the, the, uh, the issue became a national scandal and uh, the whole thing was investigated. Uh, Lieutenant William Calley, one of the commanders was put on trial and he was convicted. He was the only one uh, found guilty of any crimes. He was found guilty of murdering 22 villagers. Initially, he was given a life sentence. Um, uh, President Nixon later commuted his sentence, which is actually quite astonishing and very interesting. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, well, at the time, um, Callie's uh, uh, trial was a political um, touchstone. So critics of the war saw Cali as a emblem of America's horrible war in Vietnam. But proponents, supporters of the war, supporters of President Nixon, who were, of course, very, very numerous, thought that Cali was being railroaded, that it was wrong to put on trial a young man who was just doing his duty, who was fighting the communists uh, look, it's, a, it's unfortunate there are terrible things happen in wartime, but if you support the war, you have to accept that there are going to be uh, tragedies from time to time and so forth and so on. George Wallace, the famous segregationist um, uh, governor of Alabama, uh, went to visit Cali while he was in prison and said he's being railroaded. The liberal media is setting him up. Um, so even while he was in prison, he was he had become a kind of a martyr of, of the uh, of the um, the anti-communist uh, leadership in America. 
you can connect the dots to our own time. I won't do that for you. But this kind of thing uh, obviously continues the idea of the, the martyrdom of the prisoner. Um, depending on where you stand on the political spectrum, people like uh, William Calley become very useful uh, props in your political arguments one way or the other. I'm going to end uh, now uh, with just a couple of points about um, the sort of long-term consequences or impact of the war. Um, I'm making the case that the Vietnam War uh, transformed America. And I think for a time it did, but I don't want to overstate the transformation because I think in many ways, the transformation that certainly took place during the war and perhaps in the decade afterwards um, was not by any means permanent. So I just want to plant this as a, as a, a kind of parting thought in your, in your mind. You know, what were the long-term impacts of the Vietnam War on American ideas about itself and about the world and, and about the war in general? There was a period of reflection and humility and retrenchment as the war came to a close. I think, you know, part of this we have to remember their Watergate is on, was going on at the very same time. In the last uh, few years of the war, Nixon was was a, was reelected in 1972, but immediately wounded by the process of uh, the, 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 the Watergate, um, you know, uh, hearings and investigations, and then ultimately his resignation. So, the American domestic crisis was very vivid and very, you know, obvious to see uh, as the president himself was was uh, was uh, in a sense a victim, not of the war, but. Many people connected his untruthfulness in the Watergate case with his untruthfulness about the war in general. So it was a time of real pain uh, for, uh, for Americans who had to confront the dual blow of a loss of a, um, of a war that Americans had said was absolutely essential to a US security and the resignation of a wounded president. So a really, a really low period. And this opened up significant changes in American life. One of which was the uh, passage of the War Powers Resolution, which, which basically allowed, empowered Congress to put some limits, some constraints on presidential power to wage war. This is still um, an ongoing point of tension between Congress and the, the executive, because um, although the Congress has these powers and was willing to use them in the 70s, subsequently the Congress has generally uh, bow down to presidential authority and has let presidents um, begin conflicts overseas without a declaration of war or without a, any restraints on, the, on how long they plan to be fighting. So there's always been a lot of talk about trying to revive the power of the War Powers Act. But in any case, this was an example of the Congress kind of waking up and saying, no, we're not gonna be a rubber stamp for your foreign, uh, foreign wars anymore. We're gonna actually act. Uh, the Church Committee, uh, Senator Frank Church, uh, young Senator from Idaho, began, chaired a committee to investigate uh, the, the CIA at this time and revealed the most astounding list of uh, foreign operations, covert operations, coups, um, assassination attempts, um, one more wacky and harebrained than, than the next. And the Church Committee, coming at the same time at the end of the end of the Vietnam War, um, was another example of how America had become a behemoth, uncontrollable and and invisible to its uh, its people. There was no transparency, so the Church Committee was calling for greater transparency, greater oversight by Congress, and um, and greater knowledge of what was being done in the name of the American people. So again, another blow to American hubris was delivered. Of course, Jimmy Carter would in some ways embody a lot of these critiques of American uh, overstretch and American hubris and, and his uh, election, you know, a really big surprise, a Southern Democrat um, uh, coming in and, and a figure from the outside, not a figure of the establishment. Um, you know, Georgia governor. And he emphasized a great deal of this theme of humility and restraint. And he, he would make human rights an important part of his initial um, years in office. Um, this notion that America had to stand up 
for what was right in the world and not always be a, you know, a, a, a bully um, and so forth. I mean, it, we know that it didn't go very well for Carter, but at the, by the end of the, uh, by the end of the four years, he was, um, he was, he was singing quite a different tune, but in any case, Carter's arrival in office was very important. The army itself was changed. Uh, the U.S. Army went from a draft army to an all-volunteer force because of Vietnam. Basically, uh, it couldn't rely upon a draft because the draft would bring in so many people who didn't want to be in the military. An all-volunteer force, though, allowed the army to kind of fix itself by drawing in people that uh, wanted to be there and that were eager to serve and eager to, to learn and and the army recon completely reconfigured how it attracted people into its ranks. And so it had to jettison uh, all of the Vietnam baggage and talk about a very different kind of military experience. Uh, you know, a, a, a doctrine that would emphasize high tech weapons, um, you know, a, a lot of air power and not so many boots on the ground. So the lessons of Vietnam at the time seemed to be um, restraint, humility, caution, uh, uh, easing up on the, the the sort of big bully language of the Vietnam era, but I just want to end you with this end with these thoughts about the fact that the pendulum has you know started swinging back very quickly. One could argue, I think you could see in Ronald Reagan's uh, a remarkably successful run for president and his second term as well, landslide victories that Americans still valued patriotism. They wanted to be proud of their country. They wanted to be proud of their um, of their military. And indeed, they wanted even to be proud of what they'd done in Vietnam. And Ronald Reagan understood this. He argued, hey, we didn't lose the Vietnam War. We just weren't allowed to win. Okay, I don't believe it. But nonetheless, he was tapping into something, which was that Americans don't like to be ashamed of their country. And he was very good at channeling that to the American public. And he was an immensely popular president as a result. And, you know, since Reagan's departure, the United States did begin to uh, start moving you know, back into the role of, of pushing military power out into the world. The, the Gulf War was an enormous and, you know, uh, a very successful conflict that involved a huge uh, overseas army of half a million men um, to liberate Kuwait against uh, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And again, in 2003, a very large scale invasion of a country that many Americans didn't know a lot about, but it was popular. Over half of, um, you know, the, the, of, of, of Americans favored the invasion of Iraq um, in 2003. And I'll just end by saying, you know, on, on grounds today, uh, what do you see? Do you see the long haired hippies uh, wearing berets and singing folk music? Yeah, you can find those here and there. But I'll be honest with you, they're a minority. It's much more likely that you'll see uh, bright, smart, um, ambitious students who want to go into public service, who want to go into business, who want to go to law school. Almost all of them, God forbid, want to go to law school. And you will see many, many students in uniform because the ROTC programs at UVA are thriving. Many of these students take my classes, and I absolutely adore them. But this is a very different Vietnam, uh, very different uh, UVA than it would have been in, say, 1975. And so the pendulum swings and then it swings back again. So the transformation may be more apparent for a generation of people from the 70s than it would be that would seem today. And I think this is one reason why students don't know how to approach the Vietnam War. They're not quite sure. Was it a good thing or a bad thing? What am I supposed to know about it? So that's why I urge them to take uh, my classes on the Cold War and, and on this topic as well. Well, I'll leave it there. And we have just enough time for uh, to take up some of the wonderful questions that you have. Um, I'm sure been posing. I see the chat, the Q&A is going, and I know Marilyn is going to carry us on into the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Yes, I am. Thank you, Will. That was very enlightening, and I'm going to dive right into the questions because we have quite a few. All right, so what drew you to this field and inspired you to focus on the history of the Vietnam War? Well, <clears throat> um, that's a, that's a great question that I'm happy to talk about it because it allows me to talk about myself, which everyone likes to do. Um, but I was a, a foreign service brat. So I was born in Tokyo, Japan, I mean, Fukuoka, Japan, when my parents were working and uh, studying language. Uh, my father was in the foreign service and we lived overseas a good bit. Now, as it happened, um, you know, I grew up traveling a lot overseas and was always interested in international affairs. But my, my parents had a, had a history of their own. 
because uh, in Vietnam, my mother went to Vietnam in about 1950 to help her father, who was in the foreign service. Um, he was a diplomat, American diplomat, um, working in French Indochina. Um, and so as a brand new college graduate, she went to, uh, to Saigon in 1950, 51 and told fabulous stories about it. Well, then she married my father and my father's first job in the foreign service was, you got it, he went to Vietnam as well, 1956. So off they went. So they had this whole young life there and they knew about it and I was fascinated. I was interested in French language. I was a French major. And so I've always been fascinated by the story of the, the French, uh, terrible you know, French experience in Vietnam in many ways, but also um, a, a very interesting one for the historian to study. So I guess it was just, you know, we all get influenced by different things, but my, my parents had this kind of amazing young life and I, I always found it compelling and wanted to know more about it. So that's kind of how I tripped into international stuff and the Vietnam War in particular. Okay, our parents do influence us, don't they? <laughs> all right, for someone wanting to start out learning about the history of the Vietnam War, what are several books you would consider to be of seminal importance, either the best or the most influential titles? Ah, well, um, I have a couple uh, here. Um, there's, there's a gigantic, it's a great question because there's a gigantic literature on Vietnam. Uh, here's a book that I use in my undergraduate classes. It's only 180 pages long. It's by a young man, uh, a guy, uh, not a young man anymore, but he was, a, I, I have known him since we were young men, let's put it that way. His name is Mark Lawrence. He teaches at the University of Texas. This book is called The Vietnam War, A Concise International History. And it's beautifully written. It's really short. It covers the whole war. You can't do better than Mark Lawrence on the Vietnam War. That's just the facts uh, of the sort of war. But if you want to read about um, the human experience, I, want, I would recommend um, a famous memoir by someone who served in Vietnam. And this really helps us understand uh, the American uh, you know, GI's experience, going from being a young and naive person to being you know, seasoned and tested by the war. This is Philip Caputo, A Rumor of War, one of the most well-known memoirs to come out of the Vietnam War. Um, a very moving story of, of an awakening of sorts, like all me good memoirs. Um, but I recommend that to you. Of course, The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam was an, a, a contemporary book written by a journalist who covered Vietnam. Another book by Neil Sheehan called A Bright Shining Lie. It's about a thousand pages, so I'm not sure you really want to start there, but it was really about um, how there were people, there were there were American service um, servicemen in the war at the time who saw it was going bad and tried to voice their concerns and basically were were silenced. So it's a sort of about the struggle of loyalty versus criticism that is present in every war in every military organization. So I hope those are helpful. Hey, thank you. Um, you know, you talked about the protesters and the people who are here in the United States, their feelings about the war, but someone asked, what were the American soldiers' feelings about the Vietnam War? Yeah, I mean, of course, there were so many of them, uh, uh, you know, two and a half million Americans served at some point in Vietnam, so it, it, we can't generalize. Everybody had their, you know, a wide array of experiences, some um, some some, you know, the experiences were as, as, as varied as there are people. Some, some saw combat, some didn't, some were wounded, some weren't. Um, some enjoyed their experiences, some didn't. Um, but I think we all know that it was a really difficult um, encounter for many American soldiers. And the, di the difficulty, um, and, you know, Caputo's book is so good at this, the, the difficulty lay in in this basic phenomenon, which is they were told to expect a certain kind of experience, a certain kind of war that was just, noble, honor, honorable, um, and that was for the right causes, that there was a real purpose to the war they were fighting. But then what they got there, they found that, that they weren't fighting communists. They, they were, and this is what Caputo writes, the enemy wasn't the Viet Cong. The enemy was the weather, the mud, the mosquitoes, the disease, the discomfort, the hatred of your officers, the fear. So the enemy was never seen. <laughs> the enemy was your the intense erosion of your sense of dignity, 
because the conditions in which they fought were so horrible. So does if this reminds you of an earlier literature on war, it should, because what American soldiers went through in Vietnam is kind of like what British soldiers wrote about in world from World War I. You know, there's a whole generation of soldiers who fought in the British Army in World War I who came back and they said, you know, it, it was unspeakable what I experienced there. And, and they became lifelong pacifists. That happened to a lot of young Americans. They were disoriented and unable to process what they were going through. Now, I just want to hasten to add, that's not everybody. That's that's what we often see in the movies fed back to us, that it was a miserable experience. There certainly were people who fought honorably and, and felt they were doing the right thing and came home to find that the public had lost confidence in the war. And that was a terrible encounter. Uh, it would be a it would be a decade or more before they could feel proud of their of their service. So you know, it's a great question, and and it it requires careful study of a wide range of experiences. Well, here's another question that could require a whole semester. But um, <laughs> why was the Vietnam War a failure for the United States? Well, that is a, that is the question, isn't it? Um, and I think you know, I think the answer has to do with the United States set itself a war aim, a war objective, that it, it didn't have the uh, capabilities or know-how to achieve. You know, let's just take the, the, the Gulf War. What was the American objective in the Gulf War? It was to liberate Kuwait. The American military knew exactly how to do that and did it extremely well. And then, as we all know, stopped and didn't go on to Baghdad. They didn't overthrow Saddam Hussein. They formed a very narrow objective, achieved it brilliantly, and stopped. Huge success. What was the American objective in, South, in, in Vietnam? Well, in a, in a sense, it was to protect and defend South Vietnam from communist insurgents and communist takeover. But nobody had a plan for how to do that. Did that mean, um, you know, what did that really mean? It, well, it, first of all, it meant killing lots of insurgents, Viet Cong, who were in South Vietnam. So the Americans had to destroy South Vietnam in order to save it. Well, that doesn't sound very sensible. Do you think that would promote division and criticism within South Vietnam? Of course, it drove hundreds of thousands of people into the underground because it was so violent. Then they expanded the war to North Vietnam, started bombing uh, North Vietnam in order to stop the support from the North into the South. Well, that, that, the expansion of the war, was that necessary to achieve the objective of, of defending South Vietnam? American generals said so, but it also um, carried the war. It, it, it recruited many, many millions more into the anti-American forces. So the problem was that as American, Americans waged the war, they made their the objectives more difficult to achieve. The paradox was that the harder they fought, the worse it got, because they were killing more civilians, destroying more crops, blowing up more dams, dropping more Agent Orange. So the distance between their objectives and their capabilities was never closed, never resolved. We should never have been fighting a war for such unfulfillable and broad and, and um, in, inexact objectives. And at the end of the day, we were unable to resolve that problem. And Johnson understood the problem he was in. He understood the paradox that he was in, no doubt about it. And Nixon understood it too. And that's one of the reasons he began a long uh, process of, of Vietnamization, of withdrawing American forces and building up the Vietnamese army. Let, let it be the South Vietnamese problem, not Americans. But it, uh, it, it took so long to get out and many, many more thousands of Americans died as a result. So why was it a failure? Well, because we just were never able to achieve the objectives we set out for ourselves. So, Will, you, you touched upon uh, the fact that students now are not as familiar with the Vietnam War, and that is something that you like to teach them and offer to them. So why is learning about the history of the Vietnam War so important? Well, you know, I mean, obviously, I feel I feel history in general is important. I want students to be studying history um, of whatever period. I, I think the Vietnam War is a fascinating one because chapter of American the American experience. Um, one of the one of the one of the I think the 
the duties of citizenship, really, is to be able to incorporate in your idea of America contrary impulses. The fact that the United States is a great country, is a democratic country, um, is a country in, in which quite literally anybody can make it. Anybody can make it to the top. I mean, the opportunities, the freedoms, the, the, the benefits, uh, which you know we should never underestimate for a moment. We can we are smart enough, and I try to teach my 19-year-olds to be smart enough to understand and embrace that story of America and place it alongside a much more difficult story of America. And that story of America is absolutely central to their behavior as citizens. It's a story full of injustice. It's a story full of slavery. It's a story full of racism and sexism. It's there, the evidence is vivid. And it's also a story of miscalculation, of hubris, of using American power overseas in wars that were unjust. Now, you may say, I have to choose between these two ideas of America. And my point is, you don't have to choose. So to be a student of the Vietnam War is to encounter some really difficult problems about American society, American racism, American attitudes towards war. Um, but it's also to learn how to be a critic of your country's history while also embracing the fact that you get to be a critic of your country's history. And you know, this is, this is the subtext of every class we teach is, is learn how to be a generous critic. Yes, find fault. And then also remember that this process of finding fault is this enormous gift that we all enjoy. And I just feel like if I'm if I'm a good teacher, I'm empowering students to be able to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time, to understand the greatness and also understand that as good as citizens, we're not only allowed to, but we should be encouraged to criticize where we see things that are wrong. So in a way, that's a long-winded answer to say the Vietnam War is more than just the Vietnam War. It's a case study for this larger sort of habit of mind that we want to encourage. Um, to be aware of our faults while also celebrating the amazing country that we live in. All right, well, you talked a lot about what was going on in the United States in the 60s. And one of the questions we have is, if JFK had lived, what would have been the trajectory of our involvement in Vietnam? This is a perennial um, a subject of discussion and debate because it's unanswerable. And so, you know, you can never resolve the question. Um, we don't know because he was killed. But there are pretty strong, you know, sort of dug in points of view on both sides. And actually, a University of Virginia uh, colleague, Mark Selverstone, has just published a book on this exact topic on the Kennedy withdrawal. And I urge you to look it up if you're really interested. Uh, Mark is a, is a wonderful scholar um, mm -hmm. and has just come out. And what Mark Mark tries to resolve the debate, and here's what his argument is, and I really trust him as a scholar, so I think he's right, which is that Kennedy began to put into planning uh, a, a plan for a drawing down of American forces. Now, did he do that because he was planning to take the 16,000 advisors that he'd sent there and bring them home? Uh, did he, was he planning to completely cut American support for South Vietnam? Um, Mark says, no. In fact, what Kennedy was doing was creating a, um, a plausible story so that he could say to the American public, I'm beginning to reconsider our commitments to Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. So he could look as if he was restraining American power. It was also a way of uh, showing the South Vietnamese government, which was not always very cooperative, if you guys don't do what we want, we're going to withdraw. So it was a not entirely a ruse, but it was a way of creating a little leverage for Kennedy so that he could push the South Vietnamese to be more responsive to what he wanted. If you threaten me, if you push me, if you don't do what I want, if you keep uh, putting all of your dissidents in jail, if you keep, you know, quite literally, Ziem's regime was using the guillotine to 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 put you for capital punishment. If you know, keep that up. And, and we're gonna withdraw. So Kennedy was creating the storyline that he was about to withdraw in order to get himself leverage, not because he was ready to throw in the towel. Look, I mean, John Kennedy had, had, had just won the greatest you know, staring match in world history, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
he had enormous credibility and, and authority. He, he, people felt that, you know, he was a master of, of world affairs after the Cuban Missile Crisis, after getting the Russians to withdraw their missiles. Um, but it also showed that, you know, he understood the value of bargaining, of public posturing, of saying one thing and then doing a backroom deal, um, you know, uh, with Khrushchev as he did over the missiles. So put in that context, Mark Silverstone thinks that Kennedy was not preparing to cut and run. He was creating an image of a guy who was ready to bargain and negotiate. Uh, and that's why he started talking about withdrawal. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but read Mark's book. Thank you, Will. Um, you know, there are, it seems that there are people on this call that have been to Vietnam and some that are going to Vietnam. So a question that has come up is what is the relationship between the U.S. and Vietnam after the Vietnam War? Well, it was very bad for a long time. The Americans uh, imposed an embargo on Vietnam for a, a long period of time. Um, the Vietnamese, of course, were still fighting. At, even after they fought the Americans, they were they were waging war in Southeast Asia um, with Cambodia, Cambodia and China. And, I mean, they they faced a, a long aftermath. And the United States basically, you know, just tried to um, turn its back on Vietnam. And a lot of that had to do with uh, the bitterness of the of the war, uh, and, and in particular the POW issue, which continued to become, you know burn. Where were our prisoners? Why haven't they been returned home? Um, and so forth. And that issue, as you will know, became a very important political um, uh, football in a way. Um, but by the mid 90s in the Clinton period, uh, the worst memories of the war years had started to subside. There was a new generation of people in power in Vietnam, as well as in the United States. And uh, many Vietnam War, US Vietnam veterans um, began to speak about reconciliation. And, you know, figures like Senator John McCain and John Kerry and others who had uh, who had been in the war uh, began to say, look, it's time to reconcile. And the, the reality is that today, U.S.-Vietnamese relations are extremely good. And I just noticed that the Vietnamese ambassador to the United States is giving a talk at UVA in, a, um, uh, I think, uh, next week. Uh, in any case, their ties are very good. Um, there's a very strong trade relationship, but also the United States and Vietnam have a common enemy, and that is China. And as China's power has gotten greater and greater and greater, the ancient tension between Vietnam and China, uh, literally ancient, thousands of years old, um, is an advantage for the United States. So U.S. US Vietnam, Vietnamese relations are very good. Vietnamese have a very positive view of um, the United States. And uh, as, as China becomes more threatening, uh, that relationship is likely to get even tighter. So it's a good time to go to Vietnam. And in fact, we're going. So join up. <laughs> we'll see you there in November. I will mention that at the end. <laughs> good job. Uh, all right. So let's see. We have time for maybe two quick questions. Okay. Uh, one, is there a single digital source at UVA for information and graphics of the Vietnam years? You know, you showed those great photos of the protests on the lawn. Is there some sort of resource there? Uh, UVA Today, which is our kind of media arm, has written an, and published a number of really good articles. If you just search UVA Vietnam War protests, there's three or four really deep, uh, interesting, well-documented um, essays about the, um, the May protests, which will give you all the, all the details. Okay, great. And this might not be, uh, this might be, we'll see if you can answer this in a short, a short okay. sentence. How did the seconds. Pentagon Papers impact um, the U.S.? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, the Pentagon Papers had an enormous impact on the U.S. because it showed the the one takeaway to remember of Pentagon Papers. It showed that Americans knew they were American leaders knew they were losing the Vietnam War much much sooner than they ever said in public. So this cast a huge amount of doubt on American leadership credibility, and that's huge, right? If you're if you find out that your your leaders have been lying to you, then you you lose confidence in your government, and that's exactly what happened. Look, we're in the midst of a huge leak crisis right now, right today. Um, leaks are uh, have unforeseen impacts in ways that you often can't anticipate. And I'm sure that the one we're just experiencing right now will also have a similar consequences in the long run. You just never know. But the Pentagon Papers was huge, absolutely huge. 
All right, thank you, Will, for sharing your insight on the Vietnam War. And thank you to our audience for sending us so many good questions. Um, I certainly learned a lot and I hope you all did as well. And that's all the time we have today. Uh, there, there will be a link to today's webinar that will be sent out soon via email. I would like to mention, as Will brought up, that uh, Will will serve as our distinguished faculty host on a Cavalier Travels trip to Vietnam this November. Uh, you can find more information about Vietnam trip on our Cavalier Travels webpage, and we may put a link in the chat to the Cavalier Travels website. Uh, I hope you will all join us for our next Destinations and Discovery Talk on May 17th with glaciologist and UVA professor of environmental sciences, Lauren Simpkins, when she discusses her work in Antarctica, one of the most pristine and untouched places on our planet. So thank you again, Will. It was very enlightening. And it was a lot of fun. Have a good evening. Thank you all.